Hey, Jeff, did you ever have pets growing up? Absolutely. I had pets growing up. It sounds uh, like you may have had a lot. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, if I'm looking all the way back, I think my my first pet that I can remember was was a dog, which spoiler alert, that's going to be the next episode. So mm-hmm. come back next week for that one. OK. Uh, yeah. But I did have I would say my most important pet that I remember uh, that I most associate with my childhood was a cat. It was, oh. a, it was a tabby cat. And, you know, I grew up in a family that even though my first pet was a dog that I remember, like we were a cat family. We had mm. basically had cats from about the time that I was nine until I had sort of left the house. And then I even had a cat of my own during sort of my early college years as well. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I would say I'm I'm I've definitely been a huge pet person today. I have a dog. I'm now you know, more of a self-prescribed dog person, although I do the changes on, you know, it's, it's hard because, well, you know, people are allergic to cats, including sort of my partner. So I (laughs) see. Yep. That that makes it a little bit harder for her. If I ever wanted to get a cat in the future, you know, there'd be some considerations there. Dogs are a little bit easier. People have allergies towards them, but it feels like there's more people who have allergic reactions to cats. So that just makes it a little bit more challenging in my, my household. Yeah, I didn't grow up with, well, I had pets, but I didn't have cats or dogs, which, you know, I had a couple hamsters mm-hmm. for a couple for a short period of time because they don't live very long. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, my parents, they weren't really into having pets, which, you know, they still have really nice stuff, you know, which I understand because, you mm-hmm. know, I have cats now and my house is, you can tell from walking in, looking <laughs> at the furniture that I have cats. <laughs> Um, they, they leave an indelible impact on, on a household. That's, right. that's for sure. <laughs> but it's funny because now my sister has dogs and I have cats. So we definitely, once we got the chance to have families of our own, we had, we had pets, but this episode right here is specifically about geography is domestic cats. We'll talk about yeah. cats more generally, but mostly domesticated cats. And the next week, as you've already suggested, we'll be giving the the dog lovers their due, and we'll be talking about dogs in the episode. A whole Absolutely. episode. Absolutely. Cats yeah. and dogs is what we're having here in what is close to the dog days of summer. Um, <laughs> that's something we can tackle next week if we can figure out where that came from. I do want to say that, you know, as usual, use a lot of different sources to do the research for this episode. But there were two books in particular that I thought were very helpful that I wanted to mention. One is called The Cat, A Natural and Cultural History by Sarah Brown, which was published in 2020, so pretty recently. And then another one, The Complete Encyclopedia of Cats, Cat Breeds and Cat Care by Alan Edwards, which was published in 2021. So some pretty recent books. And of course, there are other sources as well, but I wanted to call those out because they were particularly helpful for this. Great. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we've patterned things a little bit similarly, so you'll, you'll hear kind of a similar format for the next episode, but um, let's go in the way back machine a little bit and talk about cats and, and, and carnivores uh, a long time ago. So both cats and dogs uh, evolved from a group of forest dwelling mammals <clears throat> called the um, meacids, meacids, I'm not sure how that's pronounced, meacids, um, which lived about 60 million years ago. Oh, wow. Europe, Very far Asia, back. North America. So you know, these are before cats and dogs became cats and dogs. And it's interesting, you know, that they descended from what they believed to have descended from the same uh, creature. If you go back far enough, uh, they're both carnivores, of course. <clears throat> and um, these animals had long bodies, long tails, short legs and teeth that were made for tearing through meat. And apparently they resembled in appearance the present day uh, Martins or civets. Okay. So that's this this proto uh this, this proto cat dog mammal creature. And then after about 30 million years, so 60 million years ago, you know, this is these creatures were around 30 million years ago, we get two uh suborders that start to develop. One of cat-like creatures, uh Feloformia, and then Caniformia, dog-like creatures. So we start to get a, a separation, a trajectory in these two different animals at that time. And wild ancestors of the domestic cat. Uh, emerged some 30 or 35 million years ago. What's 5 million years ago when you're talking three, <laughs> exactly. right? It's, these are uh, periods of time that are hard for, for me to wrap my head around being a human that I am. And about 30 million years ago, there emerged a cat-like creature called Proarius. Pro, 
arlerus, um, which means before the cat, I guess, if you were to derive that from Latin, uh, which lived in forests in parts of Asia and Europe. And then if we go 20 million years ago, a more, even more cat-like animal called Pseudolarius, which means false cat, evolved from this other creature. Um, it was a digigrade, which means that it walked on its toes rather than on its flat feet or using its heels much. Oh, interesting. Uh, people do. Yeah. yeah. And dogs right. are like that too. They kind of walk more on their toes. Right. Um, and this is an animal that eventually adapted to hunting in the open savanna rather than forests. So we get a little bit of a, a difference there. Now, around 9 million years ago, sea levels were, were low and land bridges allowed animals to move into North America across the Bering Strait and then subsequently into South America. Land bridges also allowed animals to spread into Africa across the Red Sea um, from Asia and some of these early cats then traveled to Asia uh, uh, from North America and, um, you know, in reverse, right? So there's some right. exchange of animals going back and forth. Uh, one of the animals that we learn about when we're kids in North America are the now extinct subfamily of saber tooth cats. Oh, yeah. Which, which yeah, you've seen yeah. saber tooth tiger. There's, I don't think they're really tigers, but they're referred to that. There's like one like some... in the Met or, or sorry, the Natural History Museum of uh, New oh. York or something. Oh, right? yeah. You'll find yeah. them there for sure. Mm -hmm. Like, a, well, exactly. I mean, obviously not a real one, but like a taxidermied one or That's something. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Um, this is 10,000 years ago. These animals had very large, flattened and serrated canine teeth and jaws that could open to about 120 degree angle. Um, and the mode of attack was to impale the prey and wait for them to bleed to death. And um, apparently uh, these teeth were somewhat brittle and broke easily, which has led some scholars to suggest that these cats may have hunted in groups uh, because oh, that way if Wait. one of them was injured in some way, they could, this is some speculation. Yeah. So you're talking about the big, the big tooth, right? The, the, two that's right, the tooth, saber that tooth teeth that, that's right. yeah, that, that gives it its name were actually theorized to be pretty brittle, which I think would probably be surprising to a lot of people because you would assume such a, a large tooth would right um, <laughs> you know not like instantly brittle but um you know and maybe this is part of why the species didn't didn't uh persist uh, i guess the main reason that these animals died out is that their their large prey that they hunted um declined due and changes to climate and habitat mm -hmm. and that's going to be different than domesticated cat which you know doesn't tends to um, hunt things that it can consume completely by itself. So mm -hmm. you know, small animals, rodents, birds, something like that. Uh, but not, you know, taking down a larger animal to gnaw and then come back to later, <laughs> like some of the large cats, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I've i seen like lions try and, yeah, I've seen a video of like a pride of lions trying to take down an elephant and it doesn't often work out well for them. In fact, yeah, um, I would say 99% of the time, the elephants are usually coming out on top of that particular battle. Right. Um, and so I but can even imagine if taking down like a zebra or something like right. that, which is still mm -hmm. not a small feat. Mm -hmm. That's more than a meal for one, one lion. Right. Totally. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the family, um, Philidae, which is the family, the cat family. Right. And there's, it, 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 it all derives from that. Mm -hmm. um, if we go back to the early 1900s, there were over 230 different species of cat apparently still alive on the planet. And today, this depends on who you ask and, and how you define things, there are 41. So a lot fewer species of cats alive today than there was 100 years ago. Are we talking all cats? So lions, you know, tigers, That's right. as well as the house cat? Okay. Yeah. In fact, this, this will be helpful for me uh, to, I'll explain this uh, right here. Um, which would hopefully shed a little bit of light on that. There was a nice. DNA study um, in 2007 done uh, that suggests that the family uh, Philidae can be divided into eight discrete lineages and four, 41 discrete species. So, you know, the species are like lion and tiger and things like that. Okay, gotcha. And so uh, let's just kind of quickly and uh, run through what these different species are. I'm sorry, the, the lineages and, and mention a few of the species associated with them. One of them is Panthera. Um, and most of this lineage, but not all of it, can roar due to the anatomy of its larynx. So, you know, domesticated cats make some cool sounds, but roaring is not one of them. Mm -hmm. Lions, leopards, jaguars, tigers, 
Um, the clouded leopard, I believe they are animals, all that can roar. Um, there are two species of snow leopards, which are part of this group Panthera that can't roar. So they're still grouped together. Okay. Um, there's another lineage called the bay cat, a number of different bay cats. There's the carousel, which includes the carousel and the serval. Um, leopardus, which is the ocelot, is, is one of the animals in that group. The lynx, of which there are three different species of lynx, and the bobcat is is in that particular group. There's the puma, which you know has cougar and mountain lion and a bunch of different names. Um, that group includes the um, jaguarundi and the cheetah. And the cheetah is distinct. This is interesting um, because it can't retract its claws, unlike most other. Really? Cats. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's surprising. I mean, I. It's, I mean, it runs so fast. I feel like there would be worries that if it couldn't retract this closet, it would snag on something and and then pull it out or something. That might be. I wonder if yeah. maybe that's connected to the, why they run fast because they're getting traction that way. Yeah. Oh, go that's a good our point. Sneakers episode from several weeks ago to talk about how people have tried to get away with that. So I don't know if it has something to do with that. Also, conveniently um, enough, talking about Puma once again. <laughs> that's right. Talking about Puma once again. But there's a leopard group and then there's the. Felis group, right? There's seven different species in this group, which includes the African and Asiatic wildcats, the European wildcats, and also the domestic cat. And every different breed of cat that we can think of that's a domesticated cat, they're still part of the same species. Okay. So there is a debate over whether cats are even fully domesticated at all. And any cat owner probably has thought about this themselves as well. Um, and the reason that this is a debate is because cats uh, can survive without people. They can also interbreed with wild cats. Um, and so, you know, there's the term like trying to herd cats, right? Which is communicates this idea that maybe cats aren't completely domesticated. They, you know, are f sort of famous for kind of doing what they want and they don't necessarily follow directions in the same way that our friends, the dog does. Yeah, I mean, um, just having having cats growing up, I can definitely attest to the fact that, you know, a cat will, a cat, a cat is very independently minded, I guess that is what I'll say. And I remember, true. you know, we would go away for a weekend, you know, as a, as a kid, we'd go camping or something. And the cat is, is mostly fine being left by itself. I mean, maybe you have somebody check in on them just to make right. sure that, you know, they, but so long as they have food and they have a litter box, they're, they're fine. And, you know, I think most cats are pretty happy you know, doing that. You right. can't do that with a dog. <laughs> no, with a dog, if you leave it for more than eight hours, it will destroy your home. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and cats, you know, there are individuals, right? So there's just like people, there's individual cats that have their own personalities and their own preferences. But generally speaking, I think what you say totally holds up. Uh, uh, by the way, a, a small distinction here on domesticated versus tame. So tame would re would uh, be a term that you would give to an individual animal that can live with humans. So maybe an animal that was a wild animal that was brought into somebody's home when it was very small and has, has learned to live with people. That's distinct from domestication. And domesticated is a permanent genetic change that has adapted to subgroup of animals to live without humans. So, and it may be, you know, tame and like tame cats may have set in motion the process of domestication. So some cats that were tamed eventually set that process in motion. Right. There's I mean, also there are, a debate. What's that? There are, there are lions, for example, that are tame relatively. Right. right? I mean, that's not to say that nothing bad would ever happen, but right. that they are generally fine to be working, you know, with zookeepers or what have you, researchers. But that does right, not mean they're that they're somewhat tame because from being cubs, they were exactly raised with people and people have interacted with them very closely. So it's they, they remain wild animals, but they're not maybe as wild as if they hadn't had that. That indoctrination exactly. with people. Right. Yep. Yep. So um, there's also a debate over how, when and where cats first be became domesticated. And I think we'd probably find this with most animals that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not a record of this happening and <laughs> yeah. archaeologists are are making some um, educated uh, guesses and hypotheses based on things that they found and there's there's ways to sort of piece this together looking through art and literature as well but the current thinking is that the current day domesticated cats descended um, from cats in the eastern Mediterranean 
and are believed to be descended from the African wildcat, which is uh, Fulis uh, libica libica. Um, and the uh, African wildcat coat resembles the striped coat of what we would call tabby cats today, right? Oh, that was so my that's cat. That's kind of the, the way tabby. they look. Yeah. Um, and the present day domesticated cats generally are similar in appearance to this African wild cat um, uh, with shorter legs. The wild cat has longer legs. Um, there's a cat and, really quick. There, there's yes. a cat called this. I mean, it's a, it's a cat you can have in your house today. It's called a Savannah cat. Okay. And I think maybe this is, maybe this is pretty close. Cause what, what you just described, which was a tabby cat sort of striping yep. with longer legs, maybe a little bit larger than sort of your average house cat, but not by too much is, is almost exactly what a, a, a Savannah cat is. Yeah, that like. sounds like the description of an African wildcat. To yeah, me. interesting. Okay. Um, the there is also some speculation that the Asian wildcat may have been domesticated, and and maybe some some domesticated cats might trace their lineage through the um, domesticated Asian wildcat. Although some DNA studies suggest that even throughout most of Asia, it's probably dis- these cats have probably descended from the. Uh, uh, African wildcat. The European uh, wildcat is notoriously difficult to to tame or domesticate, mm. and so that's one of the reasons that they suggest that 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 probably wasn't the trajectory there. Um, that the African wildcats are, are are relatively social compared to the European one, for example. Um, and this isn't all that different from you, you, when we did our bees episode, for example. Yes, we we had right. a little bit of a discussion between sort of European honeybees versus African honeybees, and just the the way in which one of those was, was a little bit easier to pacify in terms of you know, sort of their, their utilization. Obviously these cats aren't being pacified for utilization, but just still the, the differences in that, you know, geographically distinct areas are presenting different kinds of animals that have more or less, uh, more inclination for being tamed or domesticated. Yeah, that's right. So there's there's DNA studies that can happen. There's the archaeological record, but then there's also the behavior, known behavior of particular groups of animals. Mm-hmm. And tracking that behavior also is another clue that suggests, all right, this is the trajectory of uh, domestication. Cool. Oh. Well, there's a lot more to say, but before we do, I think we've come upon the time for our very first commercial break of this episode. So we'll take that and we'll be right back. Welcome back. It's the Geography is Everything podcast. We're talking about geography is your pet cat, the domesticated cat. And we're just talking about some of the the ancient history of cats. And we'll start to talk about uh, still the past, but you know how we can start to track the the history of the domesticated cat. It's likely that cats were independently domesticated in different locations. Uh, however, again, as we mentioned before the break, it's probably the African wild cat that has given us the domesticated cat. Uh, scientists have discovered a grave in Cyprus dated back about 9,500 years ago that contained a human skeleton and a skeleton of a young cat. Oh, okay. Uh, wild cats were not native to Cyprus. So that leads to the idea that this cat was brought to the island by people um, and whether it was brought there for as a pet or as food or something isn't a hundred percent clear, but there's speculation that I mean, people were maybe keeping cats in, in one of the things that we'll see crop up as we look at the history of cats is that they're valued for a number of different things, but initially there's a lot of value in their ability to hunt rodents, right? And so right. this becomes a, a big advantage. Dogs are actually really effective at hunting rodents as well. Um, and so some have suggested that it's almost amplified too much, the role of cats. But we, <laughs> I think that people know that, you know, if you have a farm, that there's farm cats. And one of the things they do is they hang out in the barn and they help control the population of mice and rats. Uh, and well, that's probably a longstanding thing for, and, and, and this ties to the next point, actually, because there's evidence from Jericho, which is on the West Bank of the Jordan River, that suggests that cats lived in some tentative, at least tentative relationship with people uh, nine, 10,000 years ago. And this roughly coincides with the rise of agriculture in the region as well. And so, you know, stores of grain inevitably attract mice and rats. 
Uh, and these rodents provide a stel- steady source of food for wild cats, which might then become tame or domesticated. And so that, the, you know, the people are getting something out of that. And then the animals are getting something out of that too, because there's a steady food supply, um, which makes hunting a little bit more streamlined. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, just going back to the grave with the human skeleton and a, and a young cat, you know, every every civilization and culture is a little bit different. But I think one thing that we can definitely track through multiple civilizations and cultures is that people are buried with things that they cherished. Um, right. You know, for a lot of a lot of reasons, you know, whether there was a, a sense of afterlife or just the fact that, you know, that that's just sort of what the custom was, was that these are your things and they're and you love these things and therefore it will be buried with you. And I think, again, not I'm not an archaeologist, but just show, having known that there is a grave that has that human skeleton with a young cat means there must have been some sort of, I would say, almost familial attachment to that young cat from that some human, kind of which, affection. Probably. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's I mean, that's where my mind goes to as well. <laughs> And I think there's some evidence for that, or some have speculated that. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about domestication of cats, it's maybe it's three or 4,000 years ago, maybe it's eight or 10,000 years ago. But regardless, this is much more recent than the domestication of dogs, which we're going to talk about next week. But I think oh, yeah. we can spoil a <laughs> tiny bit the, the idea that dogs, um, domestication of dogs goes back more than 50,000 years ago. Yeah, I'm, I mean, my my research uh, shows any time between forty and sixty thousand. Yep. Obviously, when we and we're going to repeat this all next episode for people who just want to listen to one or the other. That's totally fine. No spoilers. Um, we don't need to be mindful of spoilers here. But you know, just the whenever you're going back that far in history, I think just to point it out that you know there's a lot of guesswork and a lot of theory theorizing that goes in that we just we'll never really have a full answer of unless we build a time machine, which is impossible. So we're still waiting on. Yeah. 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 Well, it makes sense, right? Because I think dogs were first domesticated because of their ability to hunt or to help hunt. I think that probably had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that happened before agriculture. Right. Right. And so Mm -hmm. if one of the big attractions for having a cat is that it's going to help, you know, protect your stores of grain, um, you have to have agriculture in the first place, which was, you know, 10 or 12,000 years ago, approximately. Mm-hmm. And so that that sort of helps add up. If we want to look at the place in the world where cats are really thought, there's a lot of evidence for domestication. And this is uh, in the historical uh, archaeological record as well, uh, is Egypt, ancient Egypt. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot of people can you know, summon images in their mind of, of artwork or something they've seen uh, in books or museums uh, where cats are represented in this artwork. Uh, it is speculated that cats uh, likely developed as domestic creatures some 3,500 years ago in ancient Egypt, descended from the African wildcat. Um, it's a situation where cats were began to be valued beyond their ability uh, to hunt rodents and cats were, were protected in ancient e- Egyptian society. And we see depictions of, of domesticated cats found in wall paintings and tombs. Um, also mummified cats have been discovered as well. Uh, a cat in ancient Egypt was a symbol of fertility. Bastet is the goddess of fertility and the daughter of the sun God, Re or, or, or Cyrus. And, and Bastet was depicted as a lion and later as a small cat. So we start to see gods personified as cats. And we will see a couple examples of this in other cultures as well. You know, I I often think about sort of the lifestyle of, or at least the perceived lifestyle of ancient Egypt back back when it was still sort of, you know, not, not Romanized quite as much. And... I often think that, or just in, in the con- the context of this conversation about cats, that that might have been like the perfect life for a cat. <laughs> a lot of lounging around, sunny, right? Cats really like laying in the sun. They're being treated like um, like gods of, of some sort, or at least a Protected vessel of a by god. society, yep. Yeah, exactly. It seems like really the perfect life for for the modern day cat as well. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's hard to know, but it it, it might it may have lined up just that way. Yeah, <laughs> there is uh, evidence also to suggest that there were cats living with people, uh, you know, over five thousand years ago in China. Oh, okay. Um, Interesting. And so I, there's less information I was able to retrieve about that situation, but uh, cats are said to have arrived in Japan via China in the sixth century, 
So uh, much more recently. Mm-hmm. Um, in Japan and China, cats are valued for various things, but that includes hunting mice who disrupted uh, the silkworm operations, right? So for making silk, so they're valued for that. Um, and cats also protected sutras, which are the Buddhist religious texts, um, from being consumed by mice. And so this was particularly important in the case of Japan when the sutras were transported by ship to Japan. Uh, the cats protected the sutras and are associated with Buddhism in Japan in particular, in part because of this as well. Um, again, I mentioned before, but I think it's worth repeating that even cats, um, recent studies show that present day domestic cats in China are genetically related to the African wildcat. Uh, and thus the diffusion of cats seems to track back to Egypt. So let's go back to Egypt for a moment. The Egyptians also banned the exporting of cats. Um, they weren't a hundred percent effective in that, but I guess they wanted to hold on to their cats. And cats seem to have made their way onto Phoenician trade ships, Mm -hmm. where, again, they're valued for hunting rodents because rodents also found their way onto these ships, right? And cats are pretty. You would want them, you would want a cat on your ship, right? Right, At least one, right? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, for that very reason. For that very reason, yeah. And well, and cats are pretty well suited to life on ships um, because they could survive on the food that was already there that had, you know, stowed away Mm -hmm. and they don't need a lot of extra fresh water because cats get a lot of their moisture from the food that they eat. They still need some additional water, but they they do absorb a lot of moisture through their food. Uh, And then cats don't get scurvy apparently as well. So cats are well suited to life on the seas and the ship. Um, subsequently cats spread throughout different parts of the Mediterranean into Greece and the Italic Peninsula, which we call Italy today. Uh, and cats spread throughout much of the Roman empire as well. Uh, and that's one of the ways that they spread throughout, throughout Europe and into parts of Asia. Uh, the Romans took cats from Egypt or the Phoenicians brought them there. It's a little bit unclear. And, um, Romans may have also venerated cats in many ways, uh, and so the, the the cat still had sort of an elevated societal status then, but that comes to an end for a while with the fall of the Roman Empire. At least it comes to an end in Europe. And the popularity of cats or the, the status of cats really starts to decline. And eventually, um, for, for several hundred years, cats become, so in Europe, cats become associated with, with witches. They become associated with evil uh, and the Interesting. devil. Interesting. And so rather than respected cats were treated rather poorly. Now I have to imagine farmers were probably still valuing cats because mm-hmm. of the practical service that they provided. Uh, but this is an interesting part of, of history where in Europe uh, cats are, are not regarded particularly well. And that turns around after a while, but for hundreds of years, I think cats had it a bit more rough I wonder, uh, in this I, part I, of the world. I wonder if there was any sort of, you know, I'm just thinking back to this time and, you know, obviously as rats spread around the world, you know, they would bring diseases with them and that would probably be pretty closely followed by cats coming to a certain part of the world. So I wonder if the two sort of just became linked and that's what would ultimately have caused this negative perception of cats into it's something possible. that's evil. I mean, I'm just trying to like hypothesize here what what could just like make people shift so much, you know, in, in sort of the thinking around what cats are. And, you know, I'm, I'm starting to think of like, well, now, you know, you know, how black cats are considered, you know, bad luck and all this kind of stuff today, even up to today, you know, wrongfully. But, you know, that's still like that perception that's, that still exists. It's interesting because the black cat thing it depends on location because, mm-hmm. um yeah, in North America, for example, or in the United States, certainly, and maybe in Europe, a black parts of Europe, a black cat crossing your path is construed to be associated with the evil we were just talking about, mm-hmm. bad luck. Um, however, apparently in Japan, a black cat crossing your path is a sign of good luck because oh, the cat is, has done something to ward off uh, the the malevolent uh, spirits. And so it's, it's, there's a geography to these beliefs about things like, like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so cats spread with trade uh, to Asia from Europe, although there may have been some domestication happening there before as well, but that's the idea, the trajectory, of the domestic cat comes through Egypt and then through Europe into Asia and then to other parts of the world as well. 
Uh, and then you mentioned the plague. I, there was a story I read that because in you know medieval time in the 1300s, cats were not particularly well regarded, perhaps in in different Christian parts of Europe, that that may have exacerbated the plague in some ways because it's it was the flea. It's actually the fleas on the rats that carried the plague. Oh, interesting. Okay. Which, um, but the cats were kind of the, the rats were sort of the vector for that. And they would get on ships. They apparently the uh, cat, uh, I'm sorry, a rat got on a ship in the Crimean Peninsula and came in through the Bosporus Dardanelles Straits, went into um, probably Genoa or someplace like that, one of these trading city states. And then those uh, fleas on rats, you know, started to spread wherever there was trade and eventually caused an enormous amount, an enormous amount of, of death in um in Europe where right. in, in certain parts of of Europe you know a third of the population may have have contracted the black the black and at this plague. point there was like hundreds of years of cats being sort of looked down upon and so That's they right. probably drove the cats out or or removed them or killed them or what have you and so they probably didn't have a natural animal that would defend against that right. a that was bit. one less Mm -hmm. predator that they had to con be concerned with and that may have again this is speculation but there's there's some evidence to suggest that this might have been the case fascinating um let's see so uh from the 16th century on cats spread to the americas on european ships and uh much more recently as recently as the 19th century cats arrived via ship to Australia and probably New Zealand subsequently as well. And around circa 1600, that cats um, start to regain some of their favor as domesticated animals in Europe. And you can see this in part because some of the paintings from different parts of Europe um, mm -hmm. start to depict mostly the elite, you know, cause that's whose images get painted oftentimes. And sometimes cats are present there and, and there's a, a positive depiction there. So we can use, art in some ways to help um, track the uh, status of, of, of an animal like a cat in different parts of the world. Uh, something on cats and culture. We mentioned in ancient Egypt, a cat was a symbol of fertility um, and Bastet, uh, the daughter of uh, the sun god and and how it's this, this goddess was depicted as a lion and a small cat. In ancient India, uh, cats are associated with um, Shash Shashti, the goddess of fertility and protector of children. Um, in China, Li Shu uh, personified was a cat worshipped by farmers who wanted to control uh, rodent populations. In ancient Burma, cats and temples are viewed as sacred. Um, Freya, the Norse goddess of fertility and love, represented in uh, a chariot pulled by two large cats. And, you know, the shorthand for the very fertile animal, I think, in North America these days is probably the rabbit. <laughs> That's what but, I was going to say. <laughs> but cats... You know, uh, a cat can have, you know, three litters a year and can have, you know, a bunch of kittens. And mm -hmm. so cats can can reproduce pretty quickly as well. And this is clearly why this animal is adopted as the symbol of fertility, because people see, wow, there's what are all these cats here. Um, this is this association in, in different parts of the world is associated with fertility. And I, I wonder, you know, genealogically, when, if, if has that, I wonder, has that always been the case? Because I'm just imagining, you know, knowing evolution, you know, predators, a predator species typically doesn't have very many uh, offspring for the fact that, you know, right, naturally an animal sort of grows to the extent that the, the food population allows for it, right? They have to hunt, they have to do all right. these other things. And, you know, bunnies breed a lot for example, because they are herbivores and they can eat grass and all this stuff, right? So I do wonder with respect to the cat species, has this always been the case? Because it feels like at some point it was probably a fairly limited population. Or Whereas this, today, the like population you said, they, that's, they were still fertile, right? They're still mm -hmm. having all these kittens or cubs or whatever, but you know, how many of them survived, right? And, oh, into, that's a good point. Into oh, adulthood. And a sad right? point. And, and that's one <laughs> of the reasons why, you know, animals have multiple children, multiple offspring is because they're hoping some of these will survive, right? And that's their survival of the species as goes that way. A few more things here on, on culture, and then we'll take a break and, and talk about something else. Um, oh, oh, actually, yeah. So uh, cats 
poorly regarded in medieval Europe. We talked about that, the association with pagan beliefs, witchcraft, evil, and the devil. And some believe that cats were assistants or familiars of witches, or that even witches turned themselves into cats. And this has followed this old way of looking at cats is followed into the United States and a lot of representation of cats around Halloween. And there will be a Halloween episode coming up later this year. <laughs> yeah, there will be. <laughs> we'll have to repeat a little of this. You know, cats and witches are seen in tandem. Usually it's a black cat. Um, cats fared better outside of Christian Europe during that period of time. Apparently there's a legend that the prophet Muhammad is set to cut off a sleeve of his robe rather than disturb a sleeping cat. Right. So this hmm. this shows a very different status. <laughs> yeah. uh, Buddhist cultures have tended to protect cats and 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 treat animals well more generally as well. well uh, and cats, what's I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, going back to the sort of witches thing, it, it jogged a memory. I mean, this is this is something that still persists in sort of Western, sort of at least American culture today. You know, you have you know a, a not that old TV show, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, which is you know it's it's very lighthearted, but you right. know. A prominent character in that show is a black cat who I think is a witch or or some sort of wizard or something like that. I, I'm not super familiar with the show, but like it's still like that that idea, even though it's comedic a little bit now, is still very mm -hmm. present of what like what a cat means today in, yeah, it's in our culture to specifically. To track the history of those representations. And like you said, it's part of pop culture today, but that came from somewhere and that was popular culture from hundreds of years ago, hundreds of years ago. Yep. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about cats and art uh, and, and cats have appeared in various mediums of art across the world. We've mentioned a few of these. Uh, and one of the places in the world where this is pretty prominent is in Japan. So cats have often figured prominently in Japanese art, particularly of the Edo period, which is 1615 to 1867. So this is a period that predates the, the rapid modernization of Japan in the uh, late 1800s. And so in paintings, wood block prints, calligraphy and folklore, um, cats are, are pretty present. Now, Jeff, have you seen something that's called either a beckoning cat or a lucky cat? Do you know what I mean when I say that? You know, uh, when you said lucky cat, actually, is that like a little figure? I have yes. this image of like this little figure and it's like a little, maybe like a little white cat with like some yep. like rosy cheeks and like a little paw that's up. That's right. That's oh, exactly wow. that. Oh, that's, that's exactly what that is. So I think a lot of listeners, some may be very familiar with it, but even those uh, who aren't particularly familiar with it may have seen this before. And this is Maneki Neto. And Neto is cat in Japanese. And this is translated as beckoning cat. So sometimes people think the cat is waving, but that's just a cultural construct of we would have the, palm turned down to to call someone and then in, in japan it's the the palm is facing or the the, um, the palm is facing down the top of the hand is facing up like that cat and that's a cat that's beckoning that's calling somebody and so this is a uh, uh something that appeared in the late edo period and it is uh often a depiction of the one that you described which is a white cat calico cat with a few different blotches of different color bobtailed and um, has often had designed a paw that moves back and forth. And the, again, the moving arm made to our eyes and, and you know, people in the United States would see that as waving, but it's actually calling and beckoning. Mm -hmm. and, and the different colors of the cats actually carry different meanings. So the white calico is for good luck or happiness. And that's the luck cat that we just talked about. Uh, a black cat like this would be to ward off evil. So that relates to the top that what we said before that you know seeing a black cat in Japan is actually not a bad thing. A red cat would be conflated with good health. A yellow or gold cat conflated with wealth, beckoning wealth. Um pink for romance or love. Mm -hmm. If if the cat has a right paw raised that beckons money and luck and that's more typical for homes and one with the left paw raised beckons customers and people. So that would be more typical to see in places of business as well. And there's all kinds of legends about how this may come may have come about. The beckoning cat has been popular in, in China and Vietnam as well. And I think some people may conflate it as a Chinese symbol, but it did start as, as a Japanese symbol. Well, I mean, Japan, I mean, not, not, not too surprising to me. Japan is, I mean, they, they, the Japanese culture, you know, created, I would say is probably the most famous cat in the world. 
Do you know what cat it is? Um, are, you're not talking about Hello Kitty, are I'm you? I'm absolutely talking about Hello Kitty. Okay. Yeah. So like clearly like Japan has had this this history of like developing cats and sort of iconography around cats that has persisted into like a, one of the largest franchises, media franchises in the world today. Right. Well, it's interesting because reading about Hello Kitty and apparently Sanrio, which is the company that has the trademark on Hello mm -hmm. Kitty, right? Developed this. At one point, a number of years ago, said that Hello Kitty is not a cat, but a child. Maybe a child dresses a cat, but that's it's clearly a cat. I it's mean, clearly a cat. Eyes, right? <laughs> it's called Hello and, Kitty. And it's called Hello Kitty, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, that Hello Kitty is another really good example of yeah. this. And then there's one other example that's more contemporary I want to mention. Have you read anything by Haruki Murakami by any chance, Jeff? No, but I am familiar with Murakami. Okay. Um, so, and there are a number of different authors, but I think the most famous of these is Haruki Murakami, whose style is a very global style. It's not it writes a, a books and novels set in Japan, um, but uh, have a very different flavor to it, I think, than, than what would be considered traditional Japanese literature. Murakami has been one of my favorite authors for a number of years. And in in some of his books, cats figure pretty prominently. And in a few of his books, cats talk with people, they have conversations. Uh, and the first book that I, I, I read by Murakami is called Kafka on the Shore. And this is one of the books in which uh, people are talking to cats and getting really important information. And this is sort of a really big dynamic uh, in the book. So even in the contemporary world, you know, we can track over time, Edo period, restorations, modern Japan, uh, you know, Hello Kitty, Murakami, the cats can figure, has figured pretty prominently. And I think it's really interesting. There's a number of more recent novels in which cats figure prominently as well. Again, there's more to say. But what I think we need to do now is take our second uh, commercial break and we'll come back and talk more about uh, cats in the contemporary world, the modern world, and cats as pets. Great. We will be right back. And we're back. It's the Geography is Everything podcast. We're talking about Geography is Your Pet Cat. And we're going to talk about cats in the more contemporary world as pets. Um, one of the well-known cat lovers uh, was the monarch Queen Victoria of England, who was well-known for her love of cats and had two blue Persians at Buckingham Palace. And, and one of the things I didn't do too much for this episode is lay out all these different breeds of cats, of domesticated cat, which is like something we could have done. Um, but suffice it to say that a lot of these species have developed very recently, like in the last 50 years, for example. And so there are people who are breeding cats and they're looking for particular characteristics. And um, this is how you develop new breeds. Um, there's a term that I came across, cat fancy, which I always thought was a magazine because it was. Uh, a yeah, that's magazine, what I thought too. <laughs> 1965 to 2015. But the term is also used more generally uh, for pedigreed cat breeding. Okay. So pedigree is, is a documented, you know, yeah. situation. And, you know, we, we know that for example, Siamese cats, right. Are, are distinct in that they're a bit more slender. Um, they have blue eyes um, there are different varieties of these, a seal point, I think it's traditional one. And that's the um, Siamese cat, you know, from Thailand originally with um, blue eyes, and black on its, you know, its nose, on its the tips of its ears, on its tail. Um, I have a couple cats, and one of them is a tabby, and named Murakami actually. Oh, and uh, <laughs> then I we have another cat named Mochi, and Mochi is a part flame point Siamese, uh, which means he's a white cat with orange tips on his nose and his ears and on his tail as well, and he's got blue eyes. Very striking cat to look at. Oh, very cute. Maybe maybe I can convince you, Hunter, to give me a couple pictures to include on the the Substack post of this of this episode. Maybe we can do that. Yeah, that's <laughs> then a, I can I've include a picture of my no dog. No shortage of adorable pictures of our cats. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so, in the late 1800s, cat shows and fairs started to develop in the United States and the UK. Um, there's something called the Maine Coon Cat, which figured prominently in some of the U.S. events. This is the largest variety, apparently, of domesticated cat 
And I have uh, some people I know who have a, a couple Maine Coon cats and they're, they're pretty big, but I've gone online and seen some pictures that have questioned, made me question whether this was actually like, <laughs> this is what was going on. Cause the cats are so large. It's actually hard for me to believe this is a domesticated house cat. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the stats related to who owns cats and who has cats as pets in the United States and different parts of the world. And it's really impossible to know this, right? Because, you know, how would everybody, how would, who knows who has um, what pets, right? And there's certain ways you can sort of track this and that's through veterinarian records. That's through pet insurance. Most people don't insure their pets. So that's kind of a tricky way to go. Um, And of course, different businesses that, sell things for cats and dogs are in the business of trying to track, you know, how many there might be. Um, but there are some statistics out there. So let's take a look here. Um, according to an organization called health for animals, there are probably about a billion pets worldwide. So that's pets more generally. That's a lot of pets, a lot of pets. Um, yeah. <laughs> 70% of U S households had a pet circa 2021. So that's, that's a lot. 70%, I think. Globally, and again, this is just, we don't know this for sure, but this is what's speculated, that one in three combs have a dog and one in four have a cat. So Dogs are winning. Dogs, <laughs> it's not a contest, but, and people who have cats and dogs, they may have multiple, some people mm-hmm. may have multiple dogs. I know some people have multiple cats, like I have two cats, for example, but you know, some people have lots of cats. Pet show ownership is on the rise globally. Uh, one of the reasons for this is rising income levels. There's a growth of middle class in different parts of the world, and that makes it you know, people can afford to have pets, they mm-hmm. can feed their family, they can maybe uh, afford to. Uh, at that point, you know, they have these needs met, they can get a, a pet and feed their pet. Uh, and then there was a rise in ownership during COVID as well, and I'll circle back to that in just a moment. Okay. Some more statistics from another organization called the World Animal uh, Foundation suggesting that there are approximately 373 million cats kept as pets worldwide. Um, And there may be a similar or many more feral cats, which is even harder to discern, right? And that, again, this is relates to this idea that cats are wild enough where if they, they're abandoned, a lot of them can make it. A lot of them can survive. Yeah. I mean, here in, in Portland, there's a a pretty famous, um, it's called the feral cat colony or it's like an organization feral cat colony anyways it's an organization to sort of help take care of and honestly probably spay and neuter a lot of the feral cats here and here in in our city and i'm I'm assuming this is probably that portland's not unique enough in that manner that we would be the only ones to have a a sizable feral cat colony (laughs) no i'm i mean in certain places are famous for it like i think you know greek islands and places in Mm -hmm. greece where you know people are are you know are witnessing, you know, people who aren't accustomed to that are finding large populations of feral cats. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there is a big emphasis in the United States on spay and neutering cats so that <clears throat> there's already so many um, that, um, you know, controlling the population is important. Now, there's one country in the world that apparently, and again, this is a statistic that we have, where 59% of households have at least one cat, circa 2019. You want to take a wild guess as to where that might be? My, I mean, I don't know exactly off the top of my head, but just because I did a bunch of research for the dog side of this, I'm going to guess it's the United States. The United States would be a good guess um, because there are a lot of cats and a lot of people own cats. But apparently Russia is Russia. the country that has 59% of households have cats, which, you know, according to statistics that we have suggests right. that it is the place with the largest percentage of households with cats in, in the entire world. Hmm. Um, but that, you know, that, in, that, that? that surprises me actually, if I can riff on this for, yeah. for just a, a few seconds, because I, you know, often, you know, in thinking about cats and sort of knowing their inclination to go outside and sort of explore on their own, I naturally associate them with places that are a little bit more temperate in their, in their weather. Right. right. So places like Greece that you brought up earlier, the Greek mm-hmm. Isles, right? There's a lot of cats around because they can just live there 24 seven and not have any issues around that. And a place like Russia, I feel like would be a little bit harder. So it's kind of surprising to like hear that people would have a cat that may escape and then maybe not survive a harsh winter there. But 
Maybe that's there, just my I'm, own I'm, perception. Perhaps there's a lot of indoor do. cats, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, people who live in apartments, it's not necessarily conducive to letting a that's cat a go point. outside. Um, yeah. So maybe that ties into it. Uh, it's an interesting note on how the world of politics follows itself into the world of pets is that apparently Russia has been banned from several international cat competitions because of the invasion of the Ukraine. Oh, interesting. And so global politics are in just about everything. Uh, and that's something I came across here. 110 million European households, I think this is EU households, <clears throat> have cats, which is 26% of the households, which is remarkably similar to the percentage of the United States and many Asian Pacific countries as well that have around 26% um, of the Asian Pacific uh, countries. Uh, Indonesia has the highest percentage of households with cats at 47%, apparently, which is not as high as Russia, but higher than many other places. Um, looking at the United States, oh, this is a little bit to the side of, of, domesticated animals, but the United States has almost 5,000 captive tigers. This is. Oh, good. I'm glad we were talking about this. Yeah. Uh, Tiger King. (laughs) Yeah. Right. That had to come into the mix right here. Right. Cause that's part of the popular culture right now. Right. (laughs) So yeah, that's an exotic animal um, to hear. And uh, you know, there's a whole trade in exotic animals. That might be an interesting episode um, because it's a, Oh, absolutely. It's a lucrative trade, but it's mm-hmm. something that uh, can be very damaging uh, to the animals and then also can be damaging to uh, local species of animals. Uh, we'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, I have a statistic here that suggests to me which state has the most cat, the, pr- the highest percentage of uh, households with cats. You want to take a guess at that? Uh, I Again, I would probably guess uh, California, uh, maybe um, maybe Florida. It's probably going to be like Wyoming or something. (laughs) I would have gone with one of those places too, right? One of those warmer places like you're suggesting. However, it's Vermont. Vermont has 45%. Maine has 44%. And so maybe there's something about living in a place where it does sometimes get cold. That makes Mm -hmm. people want to get cozy with cats, right? Because you don't have to take them for a walk. That's a great point. It's really cold out. So I don't know if that has something to do with it. The United States apparently has, and this is a huge range because there's no way of knowing, between 30 and 80 million feral cats. So there's a lot of cat colonies out there. Um, You know, cats are notoriously not particularly social, although I feel like at least one of my cats is pretty social, but (laughs) not social in the sense that they don't have, they can live in a solitary way. But of course, there are many feral cat colonies, as we're suggesting cats that are living with one another. Uh, In the United States, over 500,000 cats are euthanized every year, right? And this is the reason... Uh, for cats, you know, the desire to spay and neutering cats because these cats are sometimes collected in shelters and shelters mm-hmm. do their best to find homes for cats. And I think there are states like California that has a law that shelters cannot euthanize cats. Um, but in many other places, there's capacity issues. And, and I suppose uh, this is this is why that happens. Um, Let's see, the United States, according to the American Veterinary Medical Association, this is statistics from 2020, and this is from the Pet Ownership and Demographics Sourcebook. Uh, And these were statistics that arrived from a survey of which just over 2,000 people responded to. So, of course, this is the way statistics sometimes work. They take a Mm -hmm. survey and they try to derive some statistics from that. Uh, 45% of household owns dogs which is um, 62 million households between 83 and 88 million dogs, which is a 6% increase from 2016. 26% uh, of households in the United States, according to this survey, own cats. 1.8 per household between 60 and 62 million cats. Uh, And this apparently ended, according to this organization and the statistics they keep, uh, a declining trend in cat population from 2011, 2016. So there's been an uptick. Um, The other two sets of animals that rank. So, you know, we're talking about 45% for dogs, 26% for cats, for fish, it's 2.7% of households. So there's a pretty big drop for fish ownership and 2.5% ownership for birds. So cats and dogs by far the most popular pets in the United States. And I think that's true globally as well. 
so n- none of this is all that surprising to me. These these differences between cats and dogs and fish and and, and birds, because it, I mean, if I think about it, sort of logically, one of the primary benefits, at least for me, and you know, this could be my own bias, but I think the statistics are going to back this up a little bit, is that a cat and a dog is something that you can pet, you can sort of touch, and there's a there's a stress relief aspect of that engagement with these animals, right? That that is, I think that's pretty well documented within sort of medical journals and medical studies that yep. being able to just touch and sort of, you know, cuddle and do all these things with, with a cat or a dog has these inherent benefits that I just, well, you definitely don't get with fish. <laughs> you can't pet a fish um, and would probably be pretty hard to do with a bird as well. And so I can see why those numbers would be lo- far, far below. Yeah, there may well be mental health benefits to having fish or birds as pets, but I think as you're suggesting, Um, These animals, cats and dogs that are furry and can sometimes sit in your lap or that you Mm -hmm. can scratch behind their ears, um, there's a a intimacy there um, that you have with these animals that relate to studies that we've probably both seen about the mental health benefits of of having a pet cat or dog. Mm -hmm. There was an uptick of pet ownership during COVID, right? My cats are COVID cats, right? I mean, I had a cat who lived to 15 Tiki, the greatest cat like ever on the planet. And it took me years to kind of recover from that anyways. Mm-hmm. But we got to the point where we thought, you know, let's, I think it's time for us to get cats. And the place where we went, they suggested that we should get two cats because mm-hmm. they, in fact, they won't, if you don't have another pet at home, they believe that it's important for the socialization of the animal to have a buddy. So we're like, my, and you know, thought, let's get two cats. I'm like, great, fantastic. Let's get two cats. <laughs> <Sold>. So, <laughs> um, of the of the households that acquired pets during COVID, 82 percent got a dog, and 68 percent got a cat, and 47 percent got cats and dogs. I mean, that none of this is surprising to me. I I, I have a pandemic pu- pandemic pup myself. Um, that I got in April of 2020. And I think mm-hmm. the logic that, and during this time, I you know, I don't know how it was for you, Hunter, but during this time, I remember sort of saying, okay, we're in this weird time. We're at home. Great time to have a, a new animal in our life that we can sort of help get accustomed to our house without having to go, you know, leave for, you know, eight hours a day to work, especially I think important for dogs. And I just remember Dogs were just kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, flying off shelves, right? It was so hard to get one. There was like, there was a lot of competition. So none of this is surprising to me that there was this massive uptick. And I'm sure cats were the same way. Yeah. I mean, I think that cats were in demand, but again, cats, there are a lot of kittens around. That's Uh, true. (laughs) And so, um, you know, we were eventually able to, um, to, to find some cats, um, you know, my cat Tiki was a tuxedo cat and I kind of had my mind. I want a tuxedo cat mm-hmm. or a black cat. And we went a few times. We didn't really see that. And then I realized with the help of my family that it doesn't really work like that. You know, mm-hmm. that you go and the pets, you know, they kind of adopt you. Right. And so it's the cats that related to us and that seemed like they wanted to come home with us were the ones that came home with us. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's how that worked. There was a lot of fear uh, in 2020 that there would be a a really large percentage of these animals abandoned, like within Mm -hmm. a few years, because people, you know, they're getting cats during this time when everybody's sort of in a lockdown situation. Um, And there is abandonment of pets and things like that. But apparently that hasn't, there hasn't been a huge uptick in the last few years. And so that, that, you know, it still happens. Um, but it, it's the percentages I think are similar to those before the pandemic. So that's an interesting thing that people haven't just, uh, you know, gone back to work and given up their pets necessarily. Uh, so a, f- a few statistics, there's this, another geographical way we can look at this is where do you get a new pet? Right. And, and I think this is for, I guess this is for pets overall. Um, and not just, Oh no, I have for dogs and cats, excuse me. So, uh, from a store, you know, 42, 43%. So that's the, the largest number there. Uh, uh, a rescue or a shelter, 38% for dogs, 40% for cats. Uh, and then there's a high percentage around 23% for both of people who got them from a friend, right? Because they, 
there was a puppy or a kitten in the mix, or maybe mm-hmm. an older uh, animal that somebody was ready to pass on. And then a smaller percentage for breeders, breeders, getting a, a dog from a breeder is much more likely uh, statistically than for cats. So there's certain, certainly people get cats from breeders. That seems um, to track, I would say. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the reverse is true of, of strays. Like there are a lot more people who get a cat because it's a stray than a dog, although that does exist as well. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently 24% of people who got pets recently used a shelter and rescues. Uh, so they've gotten multiple pla- cats uh, or, or dogs from, from different places. Well, to, you know, we're getting close to the end of the episode here. I think we've done a pretty good overview of We've done a lot of double episodes recently, so it seems strange to end after just one part. <laughs> know, one. Right. But in a sense, this is a two-parter because the dogs is the second part. There are challenges facing cats and cat owners uh, with that huge increase in the number of, of, of pets and cats is a greater need for veterinary care. And, you know, I know that our, our vet was for a while at least, and maybe still not accepting new clients. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get in there because we'd previously had our, you know, had Tiki there in the past. Mm -hmm. And so they, they counted that, you know, but um, so there's a huge demand for those services. Um, Although the rates seem to be down or constant in 2019, 2021, there are still over time. And by, by which I mean over the next last several decades, increased numbers of pet abandonment. So that's, that's an issue certainly. And then cats for cats in particular, what, whether they are feral or whether they are pets, you know, they retain their instincts to hunt and in different parts of the world are increasingly targeted for um, killing native species of songbirds and other animals. And of course this is cats being cats, right? It's not the cat's fault. Right. It has more to do with that people have facilitated their spread and allowed their numbers to grow. And so it's not the cat's fault per se, but it's, it's, it's a people issue, right? And people have to find a way to, to keep the various species um, protected. Um, And so these are some of the things that, that come up as challenges uh, facing uh, cat owners. But I think, you know, one way to end is to circle back to, and one of the reasons people have pets and, and maybe cats in particular is because they they have a lot of affection for them. And it, mm-hmm. you know, their pets are often pretty unconditional in their love, right? Like they don't care if you had a bad day at work. They don't care what you do for a living. Mm-hmm. Um, they're there to interact with you when you're at home and they appreciate you. And um, there's an enormous amount of value in that. And um, I think Absolutely. a lot of the listeners can probably relate to that. Absolutely. And so with that, I think uh, we'll first come back next week for our uh, our Geography is Your Pet Dog episode. So that'll be a fun, fun little pairing of these. These are independent episodes, so you can listen to one or both. Uh, but there's not really a not, not a strong connection between the two. They're more partnership episodes, right? So uh, you can listen to both. It's like our coffee and tea situation. Like our coffee and tea episode. There's there's some linkages there, but largely they stand on their own. Uh, so, uh, Hunter, you want to run through your pluggables? Sure. I'm Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I am co-author of Portlandist, a Cultural Atlas, and Upper Left Cities, a Cultural Atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. My co-author there is David Bannis. And I am the co-host of this podcast, Geography is Everything, that you're currently listening to with my colleague and friend, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Hunter. And my name is uh, Jeff Gibson, co-host of this podcast, Geography is Everything. But also you can find me over on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash little at sign geography by Jeff. I do spell my name Gia, so that usually helps people find me a little bit better. Um, If you enjoyed today's episode, you really like what we do, please rate, review, you know, whatever, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, whatever app you use that might be amenable to that. We really love seeing those reviews. Uh, I really love seeing them, uh, especially in sort of seeing how much people enjoy sort of the content that we create. If you're a, you know, self-prescribed super fan, please go over to, you know, geographyiseverything.substack.com and, you know, subscribe there. You can subscribe for free and get a little extra geography from us, or you can pay a little bit of money per month and, and gets a lot more geography from us, including ad-free podcasts and extra, you know, special bonus episodes that come out every once in a while when we have a little extra information on our given topic. So 
uh, we're building up a pretty cool little community over there that's been fun to see grow. Um, and we'd love to have you a part of it. So if you got have it in you, whether it's free or premium, we'd love to have you over there. Until then, until next time, till next week when we do dogs, uh, we'll see you later. Thanks for listening. <laughs>